All right, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Uh, I'm going to read a short story. This is uh, my favorite short story from high school. I, I remember this many years ago, and it was in a textbook in my high school English class, my literature class. Uh, it's called The Far and the Near, and it's by Thomas Wolfe. Thomas Wolfe lived from 1900 to 1938. Uh, he was mostly a novelist, a very stylized novelist, wrote at the same time as William Faulkner and uh, Fitzgerald, Hemingway, and, and many others. It was a kind of a golden era for uh, American literature and novelists. And I, I'm reading this today because this is really my favorite piece of literature in any format. So I hope you enjoy this. The Far and the Near by Thomas Wolfe. On the outskirts of a little town, upon a rise of land that swept back from the railway, there was a tidy little cottage of white boards trimmed vividly with green blinds. To one side of the house, there was a garden, neatly patterned with plots of growing vegetables, and an arbor for the grapes, which ripened late in August. Before the house, there were three mighty oaks, which sheltered it in their clean and massive shade in summer, and to the other side, there was a border of gay flowers. The whole place had an air of tidiness, thrift, and modest comfort. Every day, a few minutes after two o'clock in the afternoon, the limited express between two cities passed this spot. At that moment, the great train, having halted for a breathing space at the town nearby, was beginning to lengthen evenly into its stroke, but it had not yet fully reached the full drive of its terrific speed. It swung into view deliberately, swept past with a powerful swaying motion of the engine, a low, smooth rumble of his heavy cars, upon pressed steel, and then it vanished in the cut. For a moment, the progress of the engine could be marked by heavy, heavy billowing puffs of smoke that burst at spaced intervals above the edges of the meadow grass. And finally, nothing could be heard but the solid clacking tempo of the wheels receding into the drowsy stillness of the afternoon. Every day for more than 20 years, as the train had approached this house, the engineer had blown on the whistle, and every day, as soon as she heard this whistle, a woman had appeared on the back porch of the little house and waved to him. At first, she had a small child clinging to her skirts, and now this child had grown to full womanhood, and every day she, too, came with her mother to the porch and waved. The engineer had grown old and gray in service. He had driven his great train loaded with its weight of lives across the land 10,000 times. His own children had grown up and married, and four times he had seen before him on the tracks the ghastly dot of tragedy converging like a cannonball to its eclipse of horror at the boiler head. A light spring wagon filled with children with its clustered row of small stunned faces. A cheap automobile stalled up the tracks set with the wooden figures of people paralyzed with fear. A battered hobo walking by the rail, too deaf and old to hear the whistle's warning. And a form flung past his window with a scream. All this he had seen and known. He had known all the grief, the joy, the peril, and the labor such a man could know. He had grown seamed and weathered in his loyal service, and now, schooled by the qualities of faith and courage and humbleness that attended his labor, he had grown old and had the grandeur and the wisdom these men have. But no matter what peril or tragedy he had known, the vision of the little house and the women waving to him with a brave free motion of the arm had become fixed in the mind of the engineer as something beautiful and enduring, something beyond all change and ruin, and something that would always be the same, no matter what mishap, grief, or error might break the iron schedule of his days. The sight of this little house and these two women gave him the most extraordinary happiness he had ever known. He had seen them in a thousand lights, a hundred weathers. He had seen them through the harsh light of wintry gray across the brown and frosted stubble of the earth, and he had seen them again in the green, luring sorcery of April. He felt for them and for the little house in which they lived such tenderness as a man might feel for his own children, and at length the picture of their lives was carved so sharply in his heart that he felt that he knew their lives completely, 
to every hour and moment of the day, and he resolved that one day, when his years of service should be ended, he would go and find these people and speak at last with them whose lives had been so wrought into his own. That day came. At last the engineer stepped from a train onto the station platform of the town where these two women lived. His years upon the rail had ended. He was a pensioned servant of his company with no more work to do. The engineer walked slowly through the station and out into the streets of the town. Everything was as strange to him as if he had never seen the town before. As he walked on, his sense of bewilderment and confusion grew. Could this be the town he had passed 10,000 times? Were these the same houses he had seen so often from the high windows of his cab? It was all as unfamiliar, as disquieting as a city in a dream, and the perplexity of his spirit increased as he went on. Presently the houses thinned into the straggling outposts of the town, and the streets faded into a country road, the one on which the women lived. And the man plodded on slowly in the heat and dust. At length he stood before the house he sought. He knew at once that he had found the proper place. He saw the lordly oaks before the house, the flower beds, the garden, and the arbor, and farther off the glint of rails. This was the house, yes, he saw it, the place he had passed so many times, the destination he had longed for with such happiness. But now that he had found it, now that he was here, why did his hand falter on the gate? Why had the town, the road, the earth, the very entrance to this place he loved, turned unfamiliar as the landscape of some ugly dream? Why did he now feel this sense of confusion, doubt, and hopelessness? At length, he entered by the gate, walked slowly up the path, and in a moment more had mounted three short steps that led up to the porch and was knocking at the door. Presently, he heard steps in the hall. The door was open, and a woman stood facing him. And instantly, with a sense of bitter loss and grief, he was sorry he had come. He knew at once that the woman who stood there looking at him with a mistrustful eye was the same woman who had waved to him so many thousand times. But her face was harsh and pinched and meager. The flesh sagged wearily in sallow folds, and the small eyes peered at him with timid suspicion and uneasy doubt. All the brave freedom, the warmth, and the affection that he had read into her gesture vanished in the moment that he saw her and heard her unfriendly tongue. And now his own voice sounded unreal and ghastly to him as he tried to explain his presence, to tell her who he was and the reason he had come. But he faltered on, fighting stubbornly against the horror of regret, confusion, disbelief that surged up in his spirit, drowning all his former joy and making his act of hope and tenderness seem shameful to him. At length, the woman invited him almost unwillingly into the house, called her daughter in a harsh, shrill voice, and then, for a brief agony of time, the man sat in an ugly little parlor, and he tried to talk while the two women stared at him with a dull, bewildered hostility, a sullen, timorous restraint. And finally, stammering a crude farewell, he departed. He walked away down the path and then along the road toward town, and suddenly he knew that he was an old man. His heart, which had been brave and confident when it looked along the familiar vista of the rails, was now sick with doubt and horror as it saw the strange and unsuspected visage of the earth which had always been within a stone's throw of him and which he had never seen or known. And he knew that all the magic of that bright lost way the vista of that shining line, the imagined corner of that small good universe of hope's desire was gone forever, could never be got back again.